Okay, here we go. Uh, welcome everyone to our Sunday morning uh, study on the book of Mark. Uh, we have been working our way through that uh, by way of reminder before we even go into the review. I would uh, remind us of two sort of overarching principles about the book of Mark. One, it's a picture of the gospel. It's a visible gospel. This is not mostly about Jesus lecturing. This is mostly about watching Jesus uh, be the gospel. So I think that's really a neat uh, perspective uh, on uh, the book of Mark is uh, to watch the gospel in action as it changes people's lives. So I think that's uh, really neat. The other thing uh, to remember in the, the book of Mark is that constantly we see references to Jesus comes to bring the kingdom. And you've heard me talk about that many times. Uh, the kingdom uh, being here, Jesus himself, uh, the reign of God, and Jesus encompasses uh, the kingdom. And so often, I think if we talk about the gospel or the kingdom, people immediately go to the crucifixion and resurrection. What I love about the book of Mark is that he uses that in the very first chapter in the introduction. We've not yet had a crucifixion or resurrection. Uh, and I think that's really important. And I, I say to, to folks, it's uh, when you go by a church and it says we're a New Testament church, it almost makes me weep which means, uh, you know, they've eliminated uh, all that God has done uh, since the fall in Genesis 3 to uh, redeem uh, all of creation, to the history of redemption, to bring it back into right relationship with himself. So that's the record of the scriptures from Genesis through Revelation. And so when Jesus uh, comes in person, he brings the gospel and the kingdom with him. Uh, we get to see it. And so that's what we're doing here in the book of Mark couple of things from last week. We're going to pick up today in Mark chapter 7, uh, the 14th verse. Uh, by way of uh, review, remember last week uh, we looked at uh, Jesus uh, interacting uh, with people. And uh, one of those uh, things that we looked at was how uh, his popularity had begun to soar. Remember, this is after the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, and we all know that there was a lot more than 5,000 people there. So that began uh, even more to influence, you know, how much people had heard uh, of Jesus. And uh, so uh, people were bringing people from all over, uh, imploring him uh, to, to heal them. So uh, his fame was spreading. Uh, secondly, uh, we talked about last week the fact that even though um, that people came from mixed motives, uh, there were a lot of different reasons uh, that uh, people brought uh, those who were healed. And sometimes we give the Sunday school answers, oh, they believed in Jesus. Uh, if we think that people at this point had any kind of understanding that this was God in the flesh uh, and that he had come uh, to redeem the world by uh, um, dying on a cross and rising again, we're dreaming. Uh, the world just did not have that kind of clue about who Jesus was and what he was doing. So uh, most of them, uh, probably with mixed motives, came because one, they had a desperate need. They had someone they loved uh, and they were looking for anyone, anything. Uh, I always refer to the woman who had bled for 12 years. That's a good picture of why a lot of other people came. These were people that had lost hope, thought that they might be lame or blind or whatever uh, for uh, the rest of their lives. And they've heard, no, there's someone that can do something about that. And so uh, they brought. What was interesting and we looked at last week was Jesus healed many of them anyhow. Why does he do that? Um, sometimes uh, we think that you've got to have perfect faith to come to Jesus. He went to uh, fishermen, tax collectors, a bunch of heathens, and he said, come follow me. And the disciples are a collection of people who were, their lives were a mess, who began to follow him. And so here again, uh, remember the guiding force. And we're going to see this a couple times uh, again this week is that Jesus is about bringing about faith and deepening people's faith. And so in this case, he knows that um, by bringing healing uh, in these situations, he's uh, developing faith. We saw the contrast of that in Mark 6 when he went home to Nazareth uh, and there was met with a lack of faith and we're told he did very, very few miracles there. Not because he couldn't, uh, didn't have the power to, it was that He's not going to reward lack of faith. That's his whole purpose. His whole purpose is to bring people uh, into a trusting relationship with him. So I think that was really key. 
Uh, next, we uh, saw Jesus interact with the Pharisees. I always love when Jesus interacts with uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees because it almost seems like you're seeing a completely different Jesus. Uh, he is not a real patient. And, and again, in this uh, situation, they were all about him. Uh, you know, they, they were uh, way ahead of their time as far as the uh, coronavirus is concerned. They were complaining because his disciples weren't washing their hands enough. Uh, you know, I don't know if Fuchi was a Pharisee or what, but... Uh, uh, somehow, uh, uh, they, it was really from Leviticus. It was really from all the ceremonial laws, ritual laws concerning worship and how it is someone was clean, uh, that uh, they um, got their guidance. So it's not like that was the problem. The problem was not that Jesus is saying, oh, it's okay to be unsanitary. No, what Jesus knew was there was a whole other issue. Much like Matthew 19, when he challenges the rich young ruler, go sell all you have and give it to the poor. Jesus isn't saying he wants someone to be broke. What Jesus is doing, he's trying to get at whatever issue is keeping people uh, from, uh, from getting uh, into a right relationship with him. In this case, he knew it was the Pharisees' heart set on the traditions of people. And, and this, is, this is a little bit more than just traditions versus gospel. This is traditions that just happen to benefit uh, the leaders of the church. So the Pharisees benefited from uh, some of the, all the donations and offerings that might go to the church. And the one example that Jesus held up was that they, you know, tried to get off even helping their parents uh, and saying, oh, you know, it's Corbin, which means uh, I've already given the money that I would have helped my parents with. I've given to the church. Sounds very religious. What Jesus knew was they were just looking for a way around, and in the long run, it would benefit them as leaders uh, of the Jews for those monies to go into uh, the, the pot at the temple. Uh, so uh, that, I think, is really key. I think it also points us to the main thing, and we see this uh, today, uh, number four, and I wanted to read this. Remember, we are to worship Christ, not Reformed theology, not St. Paul's Church, not C.S. Lewis, not Beth Moore, uh, nor the way we've always done it. I mean, those are just a sampling of things that we can get so caught up in. They're very good things, right? Uh, but we can take anything and make it an idol. We can be about. And just as they uh, were supposedly about the traditions uh, of the elders, uh, what had happened was they had made an idol uh, of their traditions, and if uh, push came to shove, uh, the Word of God got pushed, and their traditions uh, are what uh, they held on to. And so we need to be careful about that. And uh, many of you may remember, I remember Keith doing the, uh, preaching on this uh, first, and Tony has used it since also. Uh, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is not about rituals, laws, and traditions. It is about Jesus Christ. And it's about a relationship with him and a heart of thanks for the Lord for always giving. I, I can't emphasize that enough. In recovery, we talk about that a lot, is that it's a, a what is, um, what are you grateful for? A, a, a grateful heart, recognizing that all we have and all that we are has been given to us by God. It's amazing how many uh, errors, how many uh, things that Satan would use to lead us astray that that's a correct, uh, correction for. So I really think it is about that, a heart of thanks uh, out of a relationship uh, with Christ that is the main thing. And so really encourage us uh, to stay focused on that. And then the last thing uh, that I had by way of review in the outline was just um, people uh, changing the word of God uh, for their own traditions. And that can be so subtle. Uh, very aware of a couple different issues going on in our day uh, where that's happening. I always tell people if you go into a church and someone gets up to read the scripture, and you hear them say, uh, let me encourage you to listen for the word of God, I would encourage you to get up and walk out of the church. Now, that might be a little offensive right at the point, but I would say to someone, I would be very careful. That seems really subtle. Then you hear Tony or I say every week, uh, let me remind you, this is the word of God. Uh, that's a different approach to the scriptures. And what it says is scripture's not normative, scripture's not authoritative, scripture's not uh, the word of God, and so you're not bound by it. Somewhere included in what you hear, there may be the word of God, listen for that. So I, th I really think it's that kind of twist where they just very subtly had taken something in the scriptures, created a tradition, and started to emphasize those things. 
The two other things that you've heard me talk about before are process theology and open theism. Uh, knowing that this is going out on the internet, I keep waiting for someone to uh, send me uh, a challenge on this, but those are two uh, theological positions that are very popular today. Uh, created, uh, very popular in seminaries, uh, by the way, trying to get God off the hook for suffering. And the idea here uh, behind both of those is that God is not indeed sovereign. He is not all-powerful, um, but that he's limited. And so the process theology says he's in the process of becoming, and one day he'll be sovereign, but he's not yet. Open theism says that God uh, has chosen to limit himself so that he can't do anything about uh, suffering now. You may notice there's hairs of difference, and I'm not going to go into distinguishing those. I just raised them as the kind of thing here that we're looking at, where uh, they uh, take uh, the Word of God, change it just a little bit, uh, make a tradition of it, and then they come to worship that. I came across something uh, uh, by uh, A.W. Tozer that I loved this week, and I thought it was so relevant to this very point. So I'm going to take maybe... I know, limit me a little bit of my time. I'm going to read this because I think it's so, so good about the Word of God. He says, I believe that much of our religious unbelief today is due to a wrong conception of and a wrong feeling for the scriptures of truth. A silent God suddenly began to speak in a book, and when the book was finished, he lapsed back into silence again forever. Now, we read uh, the book as the record of what God had said when he was for a brief time in a speaking mood. With notions like that in their heads, how can we believe in God? The facts are that God is not silent, and he's never been silent. It is the nature of God to speak. The second person of the Holy Trinity is called the Word. The Bible is the inevitable outcome of God's continuous speech. It is the infallible declaration of his mind for us and put into our familiar human words. I think a new world will arise out of religious myths when we approach our Bible with the idea that it's not only a book which was once spoken, but a book which is now speaking. And I want to reemphasize that. It's not only a book which was once spoken, but a book which is now speaking. The prophets habitually said, thus saith the Lord. They meant their hearers to understand that God speaking is in the continuous present. We may use the past tense properly to indicate a certain time and a certain word of God was spoken. But a word of God once spoken continues to be spoken. As a child once born continues to be alive, or a world once created continues to exist, and those are imperfect illustrations for children die and worlds burn out, but the word of God endures forever. And this is the last phrase, and I thought these were so good. If you would follow on to know the Lord, come at once to the open Bible, expecting it to speak to you. Do not come with the notion that it's a thing which you may push around at your convenience. It's more than a thing. It's a voice. It's a word. It's the very word of the living God. I just think that really it gets at it. Now, what's interesting about that is the twist that I had ta uh, talked about before. A, a modern twist on the very thing that Tozer was writing about is to say that, that uh, we're not only reformed, we are always reforming. And so uh, that is said, some people might confuse that with what Tozer said. What Tozer said is that God's word is still speaking. What they are saying when they said uh, that the Reformed tradition and always reforming, what they're saying is the truth is always changing. Those are very different things. Um, and so I just raise those things because... That's the kind of thing that was going on with the Pharisees. That's what Jesus noticed. That's what he called out. And he said, what you've done is you've lost sight of the standard. Always use the word of God as what leads you to truth and compare everything else to it. If it doesn't, if it doesn't match what you're reading in scripture, it's not scripture that's wrong. So I just think that's real important uh, as we head into today. So let me read. We'll pick up there at verse 14. Uh, and we'll head into our lesson for today. Lord, thanks uh, for this day. Uh, thanks for your word. Thanks for Jesus showing us the gospel. Continue love to watch him interact. He travels from place to place, and everywhere he went, people were amazed because they saw the gospel in action. Wouldn't it be neat if we believe the word of God enough to allow you to speak in us and through us today that everywhere we went, people might see the gospel at work in us and through us, that they might hear your truth, and that they might desire to know you uh, 
the true word. Um, and I just pray, Lord, that uh, our study of your word today would help us to that end. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, if I was a devil's advocate uh, sitting where you are and wanted to put me on the spot, uh, I might uh, uh, challenge what I uh, just said, said, saying, Mike, you talked about the, the word of God, you know, being uh, active. Well, the scriptures teach that it can be an idol and never forget that. Uh, John 5 says that you study the scriptures thinking that by them you have life, but they were given that you might know me. Remember the main thing? The main thing is a relationship with Christ. It is not even the, even the word of God can be taken and used as an idol. So while I want to use that as a corrective, I don't want uh, to, to fall off the other side saying, oh, we are about worshiping the word. No, we are about worshiping Christ and the word of God is the truth that points us uh, to him. So uh, there we go. So I want to pick up here uh, verse 14. Let me read 14 through 23 and we'll dig into that. And Jesus called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, uh, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile them. But the things that come out of a person are what defile a person. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile them? Since it enters not their heart, but their stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of a person, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. And he could have gone on and on. That's not an exhaustive list. And he said, all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Okay, so uh, love this teaching, uh, such a corrective. I couldn't help but think about this, and I don't know if you ran into this. Remember, I didn't grow up in the church, but when I became a Christian, it became very clear what it took uh, for someone uh, to be a Christian. You didn't swear as much as you used to, and you didn't smoke and drink. And if you did those three things, you had the whole Christian thing, you know, uh, in, in the palm of your hand. Now, obviously, I'm being a little sarcastic, but sometimes I think that's what people get. Uh, it's amazing how much uh, we emphasize that. Uh, if you look at the, the, outlaw, uh, the outline that I had put down, one of the things that I put down there is, I wonder why we in the church never uh, make the gospel all about overeating and make sure we have good exercise. Uh, I, I wonder why that is. <laughs> you know, but, but I think it brings us to the point that Jesus is getting at. Why is it? that there's been such an emphasis, and here he's using the kosher laws, he's using a particular instance of what goes, you know, we put in our mouth, what we eat or drink. Uh, he does the same thing in Romans uh, 14. If you uh, ever want to uh, take a look at that, he talks about uh, the same issue, Paul does. But, but why is it? Why do you think there's so much emphasis on outward observable things like smoking, drinking, what we eat, uh, why are those things held up as sort of uh, tests of holiness or uh, of our faith? Any ideas? Because everybody needs them. <laughs> <laughs> What's that, Sarah? I thought because everybody needs them. Like it's like what you, everybody has to eat, everybody has to drink. So it's something we can all relate to and it's... Okay. Yeah, it may. It, it applies to everyone. It sure, uh, in that sense, uh, it could be used. But unfortunately, I think it's used in such a limiting factor. It it's miss, misses the whole point that Jesus is getting here, at here. Why, why did Jesus say, hey, when you're focused on these things that are very common, ordinary things, when you're focused on what you uh, eat and drink, on what goes in your body, you're missing the whole point. What's the whole point that that doesn't get at? What's he thinks the main thing? The heart. Not yeah, the heart. Why? And when he says heart, what do you think? What do you think he's getting at there? He's, you know, he's not talking about someone who has open heart surgery, you know, and pulls out a an object here. What's what's the heart issue that he's dealing with? Kind of the center of their existence, like their, yeah. The core of who they are. Yeah. Yeah. And what he's saying, 
Yeah, it's the main thing. It's the core of who you are. And what what we need to understand is what we eat or drink is not the main thing. What was that, Jan Lee? Oh, I heard uh, Jan Lee trying to say something, but I couldn't hear. Yeah. Uh, I was saying, uh, if, let's, yeah, I think I have a bad connection, and I'm really sorry. If I, <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I think it's just what's in our heart, what's in our mind. Yeah, Jen Lee was saying she thinks it's what's in our hearts and minds, and, and Muffet said what's at the, the center of our being. Yeah, he's trying to contrast. It's not that our actions don't matter, but what he's saying is actions are driven by something. I always say this with behaviors. Uh, uh, looking at uh, my screen, I see a couple school teachers here, and I think when you're dealing with masses of numbers uh, and you get uh, someone acting out in the classroom, you only have time to deal with behaviors. You stop the kid from shooting a, a paper wad at the, the girl that he likes and he's afraid to tell her, uh, so he picks on her, uh, or uh, you know, is uh, being irritating or not uh, doing something or gets in a scuffle. But if you had the time and you really wanted to deal with those things, what you would do is take that person aside, have a conversation and find out what's behind it. Uh, is that most of the time there's something inside. Uh, how many times kids got in a fight that either parents were getting a divorce at home or a girlfriend broke up with them or, uh, you know, they failed a test. Many times it's what's inside. And that's what Jesus is trying to get at. He's saying there's motives here. There are things at the core of your being that are driving your actions. And if you think that following the kosher laws, if you think that, you know, whether or not you have uh, uh, pork or not, or whether or not you eat uh, uh, something uh, that's, you know, with a cloven hoof, uh, that that's really what holiness is all about, then you're missing the point. Which, again, if I was playing the devil's advocate and I was here, I would jump right in and say, yeah, but didn't those come from the book of Leviticus? Didn't, wasn't it the Lord who gave those uh, teachings to the Jews in the first place? And they'd be exactly right. Why did, Jesus, uh, why did the Lord give these laws about eating and drinking uh, to the Jews? It's not like they made those up on their own. Those were given to them by the Lord, uh, as were the, wash, uh, the instructions for being clean in worship. Uh, those came from God. But why is, why is Jesus in some ways reteaching here? What, if God gave them, why does he now seem to be changing the message? Because he was drawing them out as his people and protecting them from the environment they were in. Sure. Yeah, I think you're right, Jan Lee, in that early on when he uh, establishes a covenant with his people, it was really important for them to know to be, as you say, different, to, to not, uh, life was no longer uh, okay for them to just live like everyone else. And, uh, and what was going to guide and direct that was trying to please him, uh, obeying him in every way. And so while he was teaching, he used some very specific teaching to teach them how important obeying him was. I'll give you a New Testament example. Think of Acts 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira, he's teaching them about truthfulness, right? Uh, and they give a gift to the church, which is a wonderful blessing. But when they do it, they lie uh, about how much they gave. And they are struck dead. There are so many people who are horrified by that story in the New Testament. Doesn't say he condemned the hell. Uh, I don't I have any idea. If they truly were believers and uh, in relationship with him, they'll be in heaven uh, as much as anyone else who believed in, in him. But what was going on was that God was teaching people how important truthfulness was. I think that's a great example of what the kosher laws were. The kosher laws were teaching them about obeying the word of God and doing living life according to what he teaches us uh, to do. And so that's what Jesus is getting at here. He's saying, God gave you the kosher laws, not for a standard by which outwardly you could look at and compare yourself to other people and saying, I'm, I guess I'm better than them, uh, you know, because I don't drink as much as them. I don't, but that's why when I go back to the smoking, drinking, and swearing thing uh, is that we use those because, frankly, those are really outward, obvious things that... Uh, it's easy to see when someone's abusing them or doing them. 
and it makes for an easy comparison. Um, so that you look and you say, yeah, I'm glad I'm not like all those people outside the church, you know, or in the bar on uh, Saturday night. Well, you know, uh, if we really got the gospel, a lot more of us would probably be in the bar on Saturday night, not doing the same things that everyone else was doing, um, but trying to uh, help people uh, who maybe are looking to uh, what can happen in a bar uh, and lots of things there. We owned a bar, so I know a little bit about uh, a bar, but, uh, you know, it's... Um, it's that kind of thing. It's Jesus is trying to refocus them on what really matters. And he's saying what really matters is what's in your heart, what your motives are, what drives your life, what informs all those decisions. So I think that's what he's getting at. So, and the, sermon, the ceremonial laws um, and what he's getting to hear too is that they were reflective of the holiness of God. Mm -hmm. And so... He's saying here, it's not about, um, you know, you're focusing on, you know, the, the, the outside of things and what, you know, what you're doing or not doing or um, what can make a person clean or unclean. Um, and, and in the reality, all of those ceremonial laws were pointing to <laughs> we are worshiping a God who is holy and um, to be in his presence, um, he, we, we can't be unholy. And so it's calling, you know, calling them to say, to a wake up call to say, you know, Hey, it's not about us, you know, washing or eating the right foods and abstaining from the wrong foods, but it is, um, a condition of, of the heart before a holy God. Yeah. And, um, and, and the, so the, um, ceremonial laws were, were just a reflection of, um, you know, the cleanness versus uncleanness before a holy God. Yeah, and I love that. It's a reflection of the character of God. And actually, uh, in their trying to keep it, the whole reason uh, that that was so important was that they would find out that they couldn't, but yeah. that that was an absolute necessity for being in the presence of a holy God is you need to be holy. Well, so he gives them all these detailed things, which uh, they try and do. And at the end of the day, they're going to find out if they're real honest and humble of heart, they're going to find out that they can't. And they're going to look to him and saying, God, we can't do this, which is exactly the point of the Old Testament, which is exactly the point of preparing people um, for, for Christ. C.S. Lewis says in mere Christianity, one of the most important things you'll ever try and do is be holy. Uh, don't uh, try it too long. You'll drive yourself crazy. But at least six weeks, give yourself to trying to just live out the Sermon on the Mount. Forget everything else. Just take the Sermon on the Mount so that you fall flat in your face, uh, frustrated, angry, and saying, God, I can't do this. Then you'll be ready to hear the gospel. Uh, I think he's exactly right. And that was really, uh, uh, you don't get that unless you understand that worship isn't about us. It says, Muff said, it's about God and who he is and what it takes uh, to be in his presence. So that's what Jesus is doing. He's saying, you, you had the commands, but you lost sight of what they're all about. They are not about something you compare yourself to other people and say, oh, we're better. No, you're supposed to be, it's about worship is about God, and you're supposed to compare yourself to him and understand how desperately you need him to do something that you can't do for yourself. That's what gospel is. Gospel is God doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. So really key there. Um, you know, it, it's also interesting in uh, when the uh, disciples start to uh, have a discussion with him about uh, what uh, he had said. Uh, he says, then you also without understanding. Uh, he, you know, a little uh, sarcasm uh, going on here. But, you know, I thought John Calvin raised something that was interesting here that I would not have thought of. In some ways, he thought the disciples maybe were coming to the Pharisees' defense. Uh, a little bit. Um, and, and I think I can understand why. We've talked about this some before, is that when, when Jesus starts messing with worship as they've known it, when he starts messing with Levitical law, when he starts messing with the kosher laws, the, these are things that were sacred. I mean, it's, it's like, if you want to get an idea, this is maybe a poor analogy, but if if a new pastor comes to St. Paul's and says, okay, we're no longer going to use candles and sing Silent Night on Christmas Eve. Um, 
people would go ballistic. Uh, I mean, uh, what do you mean? My, my, my daughter, Abby, uh, their church, uh, one year, uh, didn't do it. She had a fit. I mean, she was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to St. Paul's next year because I am not going to have Christmas Eve without candles and singing Silent Night. You know, well, that in a sense is when the, the disciples speak up, they're sort of coming to the defense uh, here of the, the Pharisees and the scribes from Jerusalem saying, well, well wait a second, you know, aren't, aren't these things uh, important? Um, and that's when, uh, again, some of the same things that we've been talking about, he had to ex explain to them. And I want to push this a little bit further as far as the holiness idea. I think Muff's exactly right in that it is about holiness. It is about being in the presence of God. And one of the things I don't think we talk enough of and uh, about, Oswald Chambers has uh, raised this issue for me, and I really had not thought about C.S. Lewis also talks about the capacity for evil. Why do you think it's important when we go into the presence of God, not only, not only to be aware of what we've done or said or thought or felt uh, that separate us from God, or as you've often heard me distinguish how we were created with original sin, who we are at the core of our being uh, uh, separates us from God. But the one thing we hardly ever talk about in church, which I think can be really helpful in this whole idea of, of what is at the center of our heart, at the core of our being, why do we need to remember our capacity for sin, not even the action? maybe actual sin that we've committed when we come into the presence of God as far as holiness is concerned. Why would that affect it? Why would knowing our capacity, remembering our capacity for sin affect our rightly worshiping God? It's humbling. <clears throat> it is humbling. Yeah. And I think that's key. I'm trying to get at the idea here of, yeah, what, what, right attitude is God looking for? If we're not able to keep them, he's obviously not looking for someone who can check all the boxes and say, I've done all these things. So if we can't check all the boxes what we, uh, that we've done all these things, well, what's he looking for? I, I think he's looking for someone who wants to check all the boxes and knows that they can't. And, and that's where humility comes in. And that's where, you know, uh, Matthew 5, 3, and I'll re refer later in our study comes up again, but you know, it's about blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, blessed are those who've been humbled um, by understanding what it's like to be a sinner, able to come into the presence of a holy God. And so love that uh, as he's trying to uh, help the disciples understand what was so wrong in the Pharisees. It wasn't the kosher laws, it was their use of those things in trying to use them as a reason to pat themselves on the back rather than a reason to be humbled uh, and uh, be completely and utterly dependent uh, to, uh, on God. So I think that's really important. Um, I want to look there uh, in verses, uh, the next uh, section, Jesus uh, moves on uh, from talking about what defiles us. I um, want to read 24 through 30. Said, and from there he arose and went into the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. That's one of my best responses in all of scripture, I think. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. <clears throat> okay, so here, uh, if you remember sort of the overarching thing, I said at the beginning, uh, well, one of the things that we always want to keep our eyes open for is how it is that we see the gospel in action. Now, here, I think we see a part of the gospel that we may not really see fully revealed until after the resurrection. But there's a glimpse here of the gospel in a way that 
I don't think the Jews had a, had a clue about what in this, in this healing of this little girl, uh, of this Gentile, uh, woman, what, what do we see of the gospel that they had yet not begun to grasp? That it was for everyone. Yeah. Everybody. Bingo, gently. I think it's that this is, the gospel is bigger than just uh, the chosen children of Israel. Um, again, you've heard me many times refer to Genesis 12 with this. It's not like God had kept it a big secret. Uh, in Genesis 12, when he called Abraham, he told him he was going to bless them, make his descendants as many of the sands of the seashore, and that he would bless them so that they would be a blessing to whom? All the peoples of the earth. So from the very first call, it was there, but it had been lost. Uh, and, and we see Jesus sort of playing into it. Uh, you know, uh, again, uh, I think of people who don't buy into the gospel and would almost uh, be totally offended by Jesus saying to this woman, uh, let the uh, children be fed first, not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. How, how, do, you, how do you get off with Jesus referring to this Gentile woman as part of the dogs, if you would? Uh, uh, he, he for sure uh, includes her in that statement. By children, uh, uh, he's obviously referring to children of the covenant uh, and that he was sent to them. Uh, and so how, how do you make sense of that? How do you make sense of Jesus saying that to that woman? Maybe he's just sinful like the rest of us. Uh, that, no, that's not an option. So, so what's he doing? Well, you've said many times about the the... the the actions of Jesus or the words of Jesus um, always have the intention of, of bringing faith or increasing faith. And so, um, you know, that this certainly, at least we can, from her response, um, you know, she is, as a result of him saying what he did, um, makes a, makes a statement of faith, makes, you know, shows the, the state of her heart. Um, so maybe it's that, that he, you know, it's a, an example of him again, um, drawing out faith or desiring to increase faith. Oh yeah. I think that, I think for sure he's doing that and he's doing it at lots of different levels. Uh, obviously there's the woman, we don't even get any insight. Imagine a little girl at home when her mother explains to her how it was that all of a sudden, uh, she was better, uh, so it's going to impact her. But here, I think, uh, when he chooses to use that language, whose language is he using when he says, is it right to uh, uh, throw, uh, take the bread and give it to uh, the dogs? The Jews. Yeah. The Jews, yeah. Bingo. So that's exactly how the Jews uh, viewed uh, Gentiles. And Gentile meaning... That's anyone that's uh, not uh, a Jew. So that's how they viewed the rest of the world. They were the chosen children of Israel. And as far as they were concerned, uh, everyone else was like dogs. And uh, it gets even more uh, specific. Jewish men could probably be accused of doing that even with Jewish women. Uh, you know, the whole setup of the temple was that you had the Holy of Holies and that only Jewish men could go into that inner court. Uh, and a Jewish man, thank God, every night he wasn't born a woman or a Gentile. So there was, there was some understanding here, a view of looking at people uh, in a certain way. And so what, what Jesus does is that Jesus interacts with the dogs, if you would, at least uh, how the, uh, the Jews have classified them. And, uh, and while... They may say, yeah, but he, he used those very words in talking to her, and I think for the reason that Muff talked about, but he does that, and then we talk about the book of Mark being about seeing the gospel. So regardless of, I think, how he lured in uh, the Jews to say, oh, yeah, this is who you are. You don't deserve uh, to have anything from, from Jesus. What did Jesus do? Regardless of what he said, what did he, what did he do? 
gave her what she asked for. Yeah. He, he, her, and, and he points specifically to her faith, what she said in response that showed him uh, the trust that she was putting in him, and he rewards that. Um, and so all of a sudden, without, this is not Galatians 3.28 yet. Jesus is not yet uh, using Paul to say, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. But this is a glimpse of, oh my gosh, Here's a woman who knows nothing of Abraham, probably doesn't know the commandments, knows nothing of these uh, traditions that we're talking about uh, of the elders. And because of her faith, Jesus heals her daughter. And that, that begins to, you know, starts to crack the whole system of how it is that someone sees themselves right related to God. Now, we won't see that. Jesus specifically will you know, send the disciples out. And uh, I think with the uh, Acts 1 thing to take uh, the gospel to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uh, again, uh, people they would have never thought the gospel could go out to, and then to the ends of the earth. So the gospel becomes very clear that it's meant for everyone uh, after the resurrection. But here, he's giving a, a glimpse of it uh, for the first time. Now, a couple just background pieces. It says that he goes to Tyre and Sidon. Uh, that's the area north of the Sea of Galilee, right against the Mediterranean Sea, if you can sort of picture uh, that um, uh, in your mind. We're also told that uh, he goes to this area, um, often to referred to as Phoenicia, and that's why she's referred to as a Syro-Phoenician woman. It's the country of Syria, uh, that area, but in this uh, area of Phoenicia. So um, Jesus goes, but... He, he meant for the home that he went into to be a private visit. <laughs> uh, we see how hard uh, or how well that's uh, working uh, these days uh, for him is that he's not there any time at all and all of a sudden this woman shows up, which again, uh, I only raise that because how many times, and we're going to uh, see it uh, again to, today, that he tells someone, don't tell anyone. He constantly... He constantly was managing the three years of his public ministry so that what we see happening on Palm Sunday and we celebrate because it's cute to see all the kids with the palm branches and us saying hallelujah uh, was the very thing that he was working against. Uh, the, the wanting him to, to take him and make him be an earthly Messiah as they expected, that pressure was going to mount and mount and mount and mount for that whole three years. And so we constantly see him interacting with people and managing that. And here, uh, I think that uh, that uh, is some of what uh, is going on, is that uh, he continues to try and be private. He tells people not to tell anyone, but, but the, the desire, the, the desperation to want to be out from under Rome, uh, the desperation uh, uh, in uh, the first century of, uh, please, so uh, we want we want our Messiah. We want to be go back to the good old days, like when David was king. It's constant, and so as the rumors spread uh, of not even rumors, the accounts of what he's done and how he's interacting, how he's healing people, and how he's casting out demons, there's hardly anywhere he can go. And so we uh, see this woman uh, do this. Um, the other thing I think that's it's interesting with this is that. Uh, it, it brings, I think it, these kind of texts are really challenging uh, for us to hear today because this, there's this woman whose daughter is in bed from all, all we're told. We're not told exactly what's going on, what her symptoms are like. This is not like Legion uh, that we read about earlier, uh, just that she's at home. But the woman characterizes what's wrong in her life. The mother characterizes what's wrong with her little girl, and I thought that was interesting. I don't know the age, but she specifically refers to her as a, my little uh, uh, girl. So um, what did she say was wrong with her daughter? She had an unclean spirit. Okay, she has an unclean spirit, uh, that's for sure. Um, and uh, when Jesus responds to her after her statement, he, he tells her she can go home because something has happened to her daughter. What's happened? Another word for unclean spirit. 
The demon. The demons. Uh, I think it's interesting when Eugene Peterson uh, paraphrases this in the message. He says, you can go. The devil is gone. Satan is gone from your daughter. Um, so I only raise this because of how uncomfortable <laughs> uh, it makes uh, people who've grown up uh, in the modern era uh, with the scientific method that uh, when we start uh, talking about demons and unclean spirits and uh, I, I know there's some people that are like, do you people know that we're in the 21st century? Um, what's fascinating uh, for me, why do you think, was it just in the first century that people had the issue of having to deal with demons that uh, was part uh, of their illness and part of uh, what they thought was wrong with people? Or is that something that continues today? Continues. Yeah, we, we know that. I, I wish, you know, I wish I had Ken Van Antwerp uh, sitting here. Um, there are many, many doctors who will tell you that the physical symptoms and the physical aspect of an illness is a portion of it, uh, very much. And there's also a mental emotional side to that. And this points out that there's a spiritual side uh, to that. And so I, I love to raise the issue. I get really uh, scared. I think uh, there can be a lot of abuses with this. I remember when I first came to UPJ as the chaplain, uh, people on campus were very skeptical. They had had a girl who had had some real mental health issues and a campus minister had refused to let sec security uh, and let uh, the residence hall directors into a room. He locked them out because he said he was performing an exorcism uh, and that he would heal the girl. Well, that didn't go over so big. <laughs> Uh, need, needs to say, he did not do me any favors uh, uh, by doing that um, because people were like, you know, what kind of lunatic are we talking about? The problem is they, that leads people, those kind of actions lead people to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That tends to make them think, well, there is no demon aspect. There is no spiritual aspect to these issues. I think that's just as wrong. It may, may not come across as abusive. It may not come a, across as weird uh, to our culture. But to just deal with human beings as physical entities, you hear it all the time. Uh, the, we have another phrase that we use that just gets at that there's more to it than just the physical. Well, the doctor may have known what he's talking about, but he had no bedside manner. What, what is someone saying when they say, oh, he may know what he's talking about. Well, if he knows what he's talking about, what more do you need? Why would someone complain about a doctor's bedside manner? Because we're more than physical. We are more than physical. And if they're only dealing with the physical aspect and they violate some of those other aspects, particularly mentally and emotional aspects, if I don't feel safe in that person's uh, presence, if I don't feel that person really cares about me, the odds of me trusting them in the healing process is very minimal. And so I, I just, I love this as an example to, to say Ephesians 6, 12 means what it says, that we battle not against uh, flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And that that is still, as Jen Lee was saying, that's as true today as it was in Jesus' day. And, and so why do we pray for people? We pray for people. Do we want them physically healed? Yes. But if that's all we're praying for, I think we're missing the whole point. Uh, is that it, God could cure all the diseases, all the illnesses of the world. Uh, let's say there was no more cancer. Let's say there was no uh, coronavirus. Would the world be what God wanted it to be? No. If, if all the, you know, um, uh, bipolar uh, diagnosis, if all the schizophrenia, if all the anxiety in the world were gone, would the world be what God wanted it to be? Only if he chose to do it. Uh, well, if he chose to do it, but it, even then, if he choose, would choose to do all those things and we didn't recognize it, Marcia, right. would, would the world be what he wanted it to be? No. no. So... You, you see those three levels of uh, functioning, and that's my point, is just to say, 
in dealing, and that's why I love the term shalom. You hear me anytime I'm talking about healness, healing. Christ is always dealing with shalom. He, he is always working in a situation. It may be giving someone who's blind sight. Uh, we're going to see that happen in just a minute. Someone who is deaf and someone uh, who can't speak. Uh, we're going to see Jesus deal with that. But he's never content to deal with that. Just as he wasn't con content with the leper uh, to just heal the leprosy. He touches them. He sends them uh, to the temple to show himself to the priest. Because he is always bringing about healing in the best sense of that word. And so that's why when we're, when we, especially in our prayer times, I worry so much that we spend so much time praying for people's physical healing that we're missing the whole point. Sometimes we're praying for the very thing that God's using to change people spiritually. Uh, Amy's here, and uh, uh, those of you know, Amy and I have gotten so close through uh, recovery, um, but uh, our, our hardest problem isn't getting rid of uh, uh, alcohol and drugs out of people's lives. It's helping people experience wholeness. It's helping them experience a, a new way to live. And that's what the Lord's interested in. L the Lord is interested in giving us life. And life is relationship with him. And whether that's physical that's hindering that, whether that's spiritual that's hindering that, whether that's mental and emotional that's hindering that, his point is he's not going to be done healing until all those levels are right. So that someone walks into a recovery meeting and the first thing we say is you're a mess. <laughs> and they say, I know, I can't quit drinking. And we say, no, uh, you're a mess in that you're powerless to do anything about it. I know, that's why I came to meeting. And the next thing we're talking about is coming to believe that there's a higher power that can restore them to sanity and that they got to turn their will and their lives over to the care of that God. Wait a second. I didn't come here to be religious. I came to get over my addiction. But do you see that, you know, the... There, what I love about recovery is that those are 12 biblical principles that help people begin to talk, talk about the very thing we're talking about, that someone doesn't just have cancer. God is just not interested in their cancer, the cells that are gone wrong. He's using that cancer in his relationship with them. He may be using it in their relationships with other people. He may be dealing with an anxiety problem in their life. But uh, this uh, healing of this young girl helps us uh, to see that, that he is, is healing in lots of different ways. Um, and he's not going to stop until we're experiencing shalom, until we experience the, the wholeness that he intends. Okay? Um, again, I look at the clock and I say, where in the world did uh, the hour go? <laughs> Um, so instead of moving on to the next story, let me just finish um, because I thought this was a, a good takeaway uh, for us with this. In verse 30, when uh, she goes home, what are we told about what she finds when she uh, gets to the house? Demon's gone, right? She goes home and she finds it just as Jesus had said. Now, you know, I love to have this discussion with people. Uh, people are always saying to me, if I only lived at the time of Jesus, like if, if I could have just seen him do those things, then I would believe. You know, I always love how many of the 5,000 uh, don't believe. He, you know, we're going to look at the feeding of the 4,000 uh, in a week or two whenever I get to it. Uh, but uh, when, when we make our way there, we're going to find Jesus calls him out saying, a lot of you people just came here because you want another meal. You know, there were lots of people that saw what Jesus did and didn't get it. What I worry about, and this goes back to where we started today and the thing that Tozer said uh, about this, is that um, I think uh, that what he wanted this woman, while he wanted the girl to be healed, even more importantly, I, wanted, I think he wanted him to learn when Jesus says something. Jesus said, go home. You'll find the demon's gone. She goes home and the demon's gone. So you and I, we got all sorts of issues in our life. We're in the midst of a pandemic. We have no idea if the Steelers are going to play football or when I'm going to be able to sit down and have a steak like I should be able to in a restaurant that I really like being in. But I can't wait until those things happen. But here's the thing. I open up the scripture 
and it says, be still and know that I am God. I open up the scripture in Matthew 6 and it says, be not anxious. The, look at the lilies of the field. Did God not care uh, more uh, about you uh, than uh, even Solomon, you know, arrayed in all his glory? I look at Matthew 6, 33, and he says, seek first the reign of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Why would I bring those things up? Why are those things significant in us looking at a mother going home after Jesus says, go, and uh, you'll find that the, the demon is gone, and she goes home and finds that's the case. What's that have to do with us reading those things in Scripture? See any connection? He wants us to trust him, that yeah. what he says is true, yeah. and to be able to believe him and trust him. Oh, Barb, you're right on. If you were here and we were in Sunday school, I'd give you one of those stars you could put on your forehead. Um, uh, you know... <laughs> It's, it's what Tozer was talking about. This is God's word to us. God, uh, he spoke it. Uh, it was re recorded for us thousands of years ago and it's still speaking today. Uh, the question is, do we take Jesus at his word? Do we trust when he says, be not anxious? When, when, do we trust when he says, I will never leave you or forsake you? Do we trust when people are saying, this pandemic may never go away? Uh, they're, they're, you know, I saw one quote today uh, from, you know, the World Health Organization. Uh, won't go there. But uh, at any rate, he said, you know, finding um, uh, the, uh, what am I looking for? The vaccine. Finding the vaccine for this thing's like a shot to the moon. Well, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I want someone say, give me another month and we'll have a vaccine. We'll vaccinate people and this thing will be done and we'll go back to life the way it's supposed to be. But I think that, that what, what's really important in all this is God continues to speak. He has given us his word. He's given us his promise. He's told us how uh, to live life and what to focus on. And I wonder how many of us go home expecting life to be just the way that he's described in scripture, uh, trusting in our hearts that things are going to work out exactly the way that he says they're going to work out, and that he's as true to his word today as he was 2,000 years ago when he sends a woman home to find her daughter freed of a demon. Uh, and I think that's, that's what he's after. And I think until we do that, and I think that's, that's why I had to read what... Tozer, uh, read, until people read the word of God as if God is speaking that very word to us right now, today, in whatever circumstance we're dealing with, then I, I think we're missing the word of God. I think we're missing the power of what God has provided for us, for us to have faith in and to trust so that we can face whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. So that's uh, my message in the middle of the, the pandemic. Uh, lots here. Uh, in uh, Mark 7, which I planned on finishing today, but I will finish next week, uh, which that was the first time I'd ever said that. But uh, uh, we will uh, finish chapter 7 next week and uh, move on. So let me pray and close our time together. Lord, thanks for your word. You know that all my life I've been a skeptic. As soon as someone says something to me in my heart of hearts, whether I say it out loud, I'm right. okay. Show it to me. Prove it to me. I should have been born in Missouri. The show me state. I, I just do not put much stock in lip service. That's what's so powerful about the gospel of Mark. You continue to show us again and again and again how true your word is. And in 40 some years of following you, I have yet to have an example of a time I could look to and say God was not true. I know that doesn't prove it for other people, but I pray that people would have the same kind of experience of, of reading your word, of getting to know you, of hearing your promises, and again and again and again and again, regardless of circumstance, finding out that you are true. May God be found true, though every person a liar. Lord, you are true, and I thank you for sharing that truth with us. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.